Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tuesday Talks, an exciting online talk show that delves into the vibrant world of art. I'm Iftikhar Ahmed, the editor of Abir Pothi. Joining us today is Andrea Berge from New York, a remarkable visual artist and the founder and editor of an art magazine called Cut Me Up. Andrea's artistic practice is a harmonious blend of collages, sculptures, and found material, resulting in captivating works that explore the passage of time, themes of destruction and decay. Today, we are thrilled to have Andrea join us on Tuesday Talks to share her insights and experiences in navigating New York's contemporary art scene. As we explore the dynamic artistic landscape of the city, Andrea will be offer her unique perspective as a visual artist, shedding light on the challenges, inspiration and opportunities she encounters in her creative journey. Hello, Andrea. How are you? I'm good. Very happy to be here. How are you? (laughs) I'm good too. Thank you. Great. So I would like to start the discussion with a very generic question. How would you describe the current state of New York's contemporary art scene? That's a difficult question. Um, The current situation is... There's um, a lot of vibrant art happening in certain pockets. There's been a lot of changes since I moved to New York, um, but there are still a lot of amazing things happening. It's my my first thought on that. All right. And uh, what are some of the prominent art galleries or exhibition spaces in New York that are pushing the boundaries of contemporary art that we can see today? Well, um, so there are a lot of major, you know, blue chip galleries in Chelsea where you can see contemporary art. Um, I'm really interested in seeing this upcoming or this current exhibit by Mark Bradford at Hauser and Wirth, which always shows museum quality exhibitions. And um, David Zwerner, another great gallery in Chelsea, as well as um, um, I'll bring up another gallery later. So there are a lot of major galleries there showing um, contemporary artists, masters, and then a lot of smaller galleries have moved to Tribeca in lower Manhattan, where you can see emerging artists, um, a lot of younger artists, a lot of really um, new takes and fresh work, Um, as well as in the boroughs, there's a lot more galleries, which has changed. So Brooklyn and Queens, the Bronx, Um, where I live in, Brooklyn, there used to be a lot of galleries, and now there are a lot of them in Queens in the areas surrounding. Um, So a lot of small spaces, sometimes in people's homes, sometimes in um, kind of converted storefront spaces where you can see very interesting fresh work that wouldn't be shown in the major galleries. How important do you think uh, it is to have a physical gallery space in the time of technology where we can have online space as well. How do you think why it's important? Um, I think that it's, it's, I, I personally feel that it's still important to see work in person, um, making work that's based in physical processes. I think that there are certain things in that experience that can't tra- be translated into the virtual. I know that people will argue with me that there's virtual experiences that are just as good as the physical. Um, but personally, I, I love the experience of going into a space that's set up to show a certain type of work totally. and and um, absorbing the work within that space with my physical body. So uh, I think that virtual spaces can can bring us to places that we cannot go physically, but you know, I appreciate being able to go to physical galleries as a, a major component of art seeing. All right. So uh, New York, as we all know, is a place of a diverse cultural landscape. And uh, how do you think it, how, how does it influence the contemporary art scene of the city? Like people coming from uh, all over the world at a place, how does this impact? That's a, that's a great question. Um, that's a huge question. I mean, um, <laughs> I think that the art world has has shifted, especially in the last couple of years, to embr- embracing more diverse artists as more as 
as well as more diverse um, points of view to the art itself. So I think, you know, there's a lot of that shift happening. Um, and I think we just see it, we see it in the types of work that are shown, you know, um, I think that there's so many kind of aspects to diversifying the art world though. And, you know, just like who goes to galleries, who goes to museums and how do places mm -hmm. bring in different audiences that appreciate the mm -hmm. viewpoints of different artists. There's such, um, I, there's a lot of people trying to do this work. And mm -hmm. um, I guess what I'm saying is there are so many different, mm -hmm. There are so many diverse artists and there's so much work to be shown. And I think that there's mm -hmm. a lot more that can be done to have that work shown. When we talk about uh, diversity, uh, we see there are female artists coming up. There are artists of colors coming up. So uh, mm -hmm. is there a change in the shift like the museum goers, the gallery goers in that sense? Is, are, you, are you asking about the like audience? Is, is there a shift in the audience? Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, again, that's that's a big question. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not a museum professional, but I'm sure museum professionals have very specific numbers on that because huh. that is a goal of trying to bring in different audiences. Yes, bring, trying to bring in um, more people of color to museums and these kind of spaces and what they've mm. signified um, is what I, you know, I think they're trying to shift to make it feel like it's a space that embraces a wider range of people from the kind of like traditional white centric museum um, culture of the West that can be um, very problematic for sure. All right. So could you tell us about some, you know, art mov art movements or trends that are currently prominent in New York's art scene? I've, I've seen, a, there's been a lot of portraiture recently, I think in this, um, expansion and trying to celebrate diversity. I think there's a lot more portraiture happening um, of different types of people. So, you know, the idea of like, who's looking at who has always been a trend mm -hmm. in art, you know, who is who's the gaze and who's being looked at. So, you know, say people of color making portraits of their community, um, mm -hmm. people that are respected, people that are, that they're intimate with. Um, you know, different sexual orientations and gender diversity, you know, is captured again in that kind of like shifting of the gaze. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of, there's a lot of work that's trying to dismantle, you know, cap, different capitalist structures, different um, mm -hmm. racial structures for sure in this kind of, um, in, in, I'm not sure exactly what the word is for it to embrace the wider spectrum of it, but um, work that's trying to kind of like poke holes in these structures. So that's that's one of the trends that I see. And of course, there's also a lot of, there's always a lot of painting. There's always a lot of drawing. There's always a lot of like very kind of um, abstract, but, using symbols, using colors to kind of create different, um, I guess I, there's probably words for these trends that I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with, but um, there's all these different strands of work happening at the same time, you know, so you can mm -hmm. go to galleries in a certain area and see all these different things. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to kind of capture the overall zeitgeist, I think, when yeah. you're in the middle you know mm -hmm. in retrospect somebody will name all of these trends and mm -hmm. kind of put together who are the major players but in the moment it always just feels like there's so many different things happening as well yeah like it's happening almost all over the world like uh representation one big thing and then anti-establishment criticizing capitalism mm -hmm. uh challenging the top to bottom power structures because because they are existing at every level and uh, there mm -hmm. comes the representation and uh, yeah in india we are seeing different kind of representation as well uh, caste representation gender representation religion and every sort of thing so it's mm -hmm. it's always great so yeah let's talk about uh, 
the role of gallery and market so you are an artist yourself so uh, i'm sure this question must have come across you before as well so i want to know how does uh, the market uh, you know it impacts your artwork or for that matter any artist's artwork um yeah so the the market um it for of course it affects artists differently kind of based on that level that you're selling at and um, I think at the higher levels of selling those kind of shifts in what the market is interested in, of course, might impact what you want to produce or mm. what you um, either what you want to produce or what you can expect, of course, what your work to sell for. Um, those considerations might impact you a bit more, I guess. Um, I don't have gallery representation and I don't I although I live in New York I don't show my work as much in New York as I do other places around New York right now there's been kind of um a few different shifts for kind of emerging art galleries so where while Chelsea used to have emerging art galleries they've moved to Tribeca and also upstate New York there's a lot of galleries so I've been showing up there a bit okay. where um it's a, it's it's a real estate issue, you know, for the most part in New York City, real estate is so high right now that galleries are getting pushed out. You know, Chelsea is where there was once this kind of pocket of galleries. That area has changed quite a bit um, and it's no longer affordable. There's also issues with, I believe, um, you know, that area in terms of there's been flooding with multiple floods in New York in the last, mm -hmm. uh, what, 15 years now. So uh, let's talk about some of the challenges uh, faced by uh, arts, young, young, young artists. So in India, we see like we have art institutes and uh, where students go to get training to uh, become artists. So they face a kind of challenge like they are good at their artwork. They are exceptional, but they don't know how to market themselves themselves and uh, that's a kind of challenge they face like they're not able to market themselves and then they have to depend on the curators uh, networking and uh, every sort of thing so is there any kind of challenges particularly that you are aware of uh, that are faced by the artists that you know or you have faced um in terms of sort of like knowing how to market your work that's that's a that's been a big one. I don't know how artists are trained right now in the mass MFA programs. Um, I know that traditionally marketing hasn't really been a part of a focus of those programs. So artists often come mm -hmm. out with their skills to make whatever work they want to make, but they don't know how to navigate um, the the world of promoting yourself, um, getting your work out there in certain ways. There's been a lot of shift towards supporting artists doing that. I don't even know if it's a shift, but there's a lot of programs, professional development programs from say nonprofit galleries, other art spaces mm -hmm. in which they train artists, you know, how to, from everything from like how to photograph your work, how to talk about your work, how to, you know, write your press mm -hmm. release, how to set up your website, and then how to get publicity, how to write to, you know, the arts, um, papers and art websites and try to get coverage of your work. And I know that can be a very like daunting, difficult process. It definitely is. I think that, you know, communities are really the best way for artists to do that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of encouragement. I mean, that is the one thing that MFA programs provide. Well, there's many things, but one of them is providing that community so that artists can support each other and make those kind of connections, mm -hmm. kind of like word of mouth recommendation of an artist to a gallery is a very strong form of connection. So if you know people who are going to recommend you, that's that's very important. Um, there open, you know, open studios in different communities were a very... Um, positive way for artists to get their work out there as well. That's shifted a bit too, but say my neighborhood, Bushwick, we used to have open studio programs that the community organized and um, they would have a map of all the studios in the area. And so it would draw 
people just to come out and see the work. And that was um, a lot of exposure. You know, there was like the writers for the New York Times would come out sometimes for that. So you could get your work seen that way. So all these kind of like community organized groups, I think, have been really helpful with developing that kind of first level of promotion and mm -hmm. um, connections that I think it's really hard to kind of like hold call and develop on your own. So for me, that's been a very helpful thing. Is pursuing uh, art very expensive in New York? Um, yes, <laughs> for sure. Um, again, <laughs> real estate, I think, is the major thing. Um, I moved to New York City 20 years ago now. It'll be my 20th anniversary this coming wow. September. Congratulations. In Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I moved from upstate New York, so it wasn't that far for me. Of course, people come from all mm -hmm. over the world. And, um, you know, the shifts in real estate have changed so much since then. And um, affordable studio space, you know, is what many artists need. I mean, now there's more artists who are working digitally as well. But there used to be affordable studio space a great many places or divided up spaces or people would build out spaces and you could rent it for, I don't know, you know, from probably $300 to like whatever, a huge amount back then. But now there's, there's very little uh, space available at those, at those um, affordable ranges. So people have to travel a great deal further to get cheap studio space. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's hard for artists to make <laughs> larger work. You know, a lot of my colleagues talk about not being able to make, you know, the large artwork that galleries sometimes demand because yeah. they don't have large enough space. They have to have a storage space. Um, you know, you have to have a job that will pay for these things now. I mean, there's kind of the mythology of New York that's based on like the loft scene of the 60s or the 80s where people mm -hmm. would rent these really cheap spaces and then they didn't have to have um, a very well-paying job to sustain that because it was you know, cheaper at the time so they could spend more time on their work. So I think there's a lot more that artists have to do right now to have a practice in the city unless they're at that place of selling a lot of work for <laughs> more money. Yeah. It's ideal. really excruciating to think of all the logistics and living and expenses, especially when you are an artist and you need that uh, creative headspace to think of your art and uh, being more uh, productive and creative. And uh, yeah, these things are really challenging. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, you're also uh, the founder and editor of Cut Me Up magazine. So could you tell us uh, about it? What inspired you to start Cut Me Up magazine? And uh, yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm, a, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a collage-based artist and I'm really interested in these kind of Psych I'm interested in cycles of life, of deterioration, decay, and rebirth, and um, collage mm -hmm. is a perfect vehicle for that because you're using materials that have either been discarded or no longer useful to make something new. And I often thought about this idea of these materials, like how do you kind of, um, how could I create something that had this idea of it being repurposed? as um, part of the idea of the object itself. So I wanted to, you know, while I use magazines to create my own work, I wanted to create a magazine that was meant to be reused in other people's work. So that's what Cut Me Up is. It's a magazine of artwork that artists are asked to, you know, enjoy it like you would in any artwork in reproduction. Um, it's an exhibition in a compact form in a book. And artists are then asked to deconstruct the artworks after they enjoy it and transform them to make new artworks in response to the artists that they're using. Um, so each issue of Cut Me Up, it's a physical magazine. It has 18 mm -hmm. artworks curated and selected by our guest curators. And each curator has a call for the magazine 
So in addition to transforming the artworks used, artists are asked to consider different contemporary takes on collage by our guest curators. So we've had very di many different themes for each issue. And, um, and then the artists, you know, they, they cut up the magazine. That's why it's called Cut Me Up. They mm -hmm. make artists, make new works and submit them. And it's an ongoing process, kind of like um, people have talked about the Ouroboros, you know, the snake that eats mm -hmm. itself. That's how Cut Me Up continues. How do you see Cut Me Up uh, evolving in the future? And do you have any new ideas or plans to further engage with your readers and the contemporary art community? Um, so Cut Me Up has, it's continued to evolve. I started it five years ago now, and I had no idea what would happen in the beginning. Um, I had no idea how people would respond to this this idea. I launched it at a collage festival in New Orleans, which was a great audience for it. So um, can can I we pause for just one moment? I'm so sorry. So sure. Oh, oh, it's okay. There was an alarm going off, but it was taken care of. <laughs> um, so I was I was surprised by the amount of um, interaction with it I had from the very beginning and I hoped to um, you know develop it with these guest curators and so finding people who have a very specific understanding of collage the collage medium and what it can do you know what it can highlight like I talked about life cycles is one thing but ideas of you know recycling repurposing materials um, considering the impact of contemporary media you know like what can using these discarded materials point out about um, culture, about who we are, all these kind of ideas. So finding, you know, guest curators who could um, understand how to use this magazine in engaging ways to bring up new ideas about collage and art in general was one of the things that I wanted to develop. So that's been an ongoing process of, you know, having conversations with people and finding out who might be interested in taking this project and bringing it in a new direction for each issue, um, which has been incredible. Again, you know, we've had issues that have been about um, assemblage. We've had issues. Uh, our latest issue is souvenir. So kind of considering the uh, connection between collage and collecting and collecting um, objects that have personal meaning or uh, meaning to um, uh, so um, the guest curators have been amazing and the other projects that I've always been hoping for with, with Cut Me Up were to have a physical exhibition of the artworks included mm -hmm. and so just this year we have um, for the new issue, Souvenir, which was curated by Kathy Greenwood, who is a curator at an airport, the Albany International Airport here in New York State. It's just two and a half hours outside of New York City. So she's going to have a physical exhibition of the artworks included at the airport. And so the Souvenir theme relates to airports, of course, and airport gift shops. Wow. And they have a beautiful gallery space where they're going to show works of the artists included as well as some additional artworks so that was a major goal of cut me up because again I'm interested in having the works being seen not just in the reproduced form but in the physical way and um, for the fifth anniversary of cut me up this year we're also going to have a panel discussion at the collage festival where it was launched to talk about the impact of cut me up um, with artists who've been involved since the very beginning with some of the curators who've been involved and, you know, as the editor of the magazine now, which is what I consider myself, because I have all these other people working with me, I really wanted to explore with this panel discussion how it has, how the magazine has impacted artists, you know, how has it influenced mm -hmm. their own work? How have the ideas of um, transforming other people's artwork as a form of communication, has that changed how they think about collage? And, you know, with the curators having these kind of themes that are important to them, I was curious about how the work that we got for each issue impacted their ideas about each theme. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really interested to see how these people who have engaged with it have been changed by the experience in some way, if at all. You know, you can't really assume anything, but it's a great opportunity to find out what this ongoing project has has done with um, the people who've been a part of it before the people who've been a part of it. How can we uh, access this magazine? Like, would you tell us our audience? Um, yes, so it's we it's sold at a few bookstores in the U.S., but mainly we do all of our um, selling online. So cutmeupmagazine.com is the website mm -hmm. where you can find out information about all of the past issues. You can subscribe there as well and purchase issues. And we have all the submission information for each issue on the website as well. Yeah. Could you tell your website? Uh, cutmeupmagazine.com. Cutmeupmagazine.com it is. Yeah. All right, Andrea, is there anything that you would like to add to our conversation? Um, no, it's, it's been a, a pleasure <laughs> to talk to you about. <laughs> All right, and that brings us. <laughs> yeah, sorry, go ahead. You were saying something. I was just saying it's been a pleasure to talk about such wide-ranging topics. I hope I was able to speak <laughs> to you. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of our insightful conversation with Andrea Berge, the founder and the editor of Cut Me Up magazine. Uh, we have explored the vibrant contemporary art scene in New York through Andrea's unique perspective as both a visual artist and editor of an art magazine. Uh, we discussed the influence of city's diverse cultural landscape, the impact of art market and the challenges and opportunities uh, artists face in New York. Uh, compared to other art scenes around the world. Furthermore, Andrea shared with us inspiration behind uh, starting Cut Me Up magazine and uh, adopting a participatory approach of art creation. Well, stay tuned for more fascinating discussions on vibrant art and art world. Thank you for all joining us and thank you, Andrea. You have a wonderful day. Thank you.